Hello, everybody, and welcome to VetNet Webinars, uh, the Veteran Network. This session today is brought to you by IVMF, Institute for Veterans and Military Families. And IVMF has portfolio programs, including entrepreneurship, transition, career transition programs. We do a lot of uh, community re outreach and uh, research development. We serviced over, over 32,000 veterans and their family members. And if you want more information on IVMF, please visit uh, ivmf.syracuse.edu. But today, our session is on access, access to capital for startups, for small businesses. And we have two great guest speakers who are uh, also partners of IVMF as well. Uh, they're going to talk to you about how you can get out there and start crowdfunding you know, loans in terms of getting capital for your business. Uh, we also have uh, other varieties of partners out there as well, not including street traders, you know, Action, uh, Kiva Zip, and other ones as well. So today, you know, I welcome Andrew. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Elvis. Thanks for the IVMF for inviting me today. My name is Andrew Rackmel, and uh, I'm the co-founder of Peerbackers and Worthy Financial, that's two companies at the forefront of capital formation for business and personal savings. Um, Elvis, I don't know, but StreetShare's screen is up. Why I'm, I don't know if that's what the audience is seeing or not, but um, anyway, Peerbackers is a company that I co-founded about eight, nine years ago when uh, crowdfunding really started to take shape. Um, it's the time you might know of a, crowdfunding platform called Kickstarter, for example. So Peerbacker started around the same time. It's a rewards-based crowdfunding platform. In other words, there are no investors that uh, invest into these startup companies that post on, on any of the rewards-based crowdfunding platforms. Um, so Peerbackers um, started out as a crowdfunding platform and we later uh, sold that technology, the back-end technology, but that's really um, sort of the, the knowledge that, uh, you know, that we, ha that I have and my partner have from moving forward from that point because the ecosystem in crowdfunding has changed dramatically since the advent of the Jobs Act about five years ago. Um, Worthy Financial is a financial service company. We help folks save and invest money uh, we also help comp we also help uh, businesses and individuals borrow money from what's called peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms, and that's something I'll get into a little bit later. So let's talk a little bit about how crowdfunding is really helping startups today. Um, the industry has exponentially grown in the last eight to ten years. It's a huge industry with a lot of players in it, and uh, perhaps we can discuss a little bit about that this afternoon to see how um, you guys um, can take advantage of uh, some of these platforms to help you, um, you know, raise some capital for your business. So basically, cr crowdfunding falls into two basic categories, um, rewards-based and equity-based. And the rewards-based crowdfunding is simply the concept that um, it's easier to get a little bit of money from a lot of people than a lot of money from just one or two people. So that's the premise. And of course, social media has re is re really plays a key component into utilizing crowdfunding to your success today. So uh, there are, um, as far as rewards-based crowdfunding platforms, there are many, many out there. Um, they cater to different types of businesses. So you definitely wanna do your research on which ones to use. Um, but there are some basic best practices in terms of posting a crowdfunding project to be successful because the industry facts are that 60% of all crowdfunding platforms actually don't raise money. And the reasons they don't raise money have to do with some of the following. Um, they really don't start with a good basis of email contacts or a database. To be successful in crowdfunding, you really have to start out with a, a sizable number of contacts, your, your own social network. And that's who you're gonna reach out to initially. And it's, it, it's getting those people excited about what you're doing and for them to share your idea with folks that they know that you don't know is really, really makes a difference and helps your project go viral. 
Another key component to uh, being successful in crowdfunding, uh, rewards-based crowdfunding, is having some real good incentives for people to support your project. That means rewards. Because the basic idea about rewards-based crowdfunding is you're going to support the company with some money to help them launch their business, and they're going to give you a reward in exchange for that. I kind of like to think of it as uh, how public television is always serving the public, and they're always you know, offering some tangible video, for example, in exchange for support. So a lot of times the entrepreneur themselves is offering a product or service that they're actually building in exchange for that money. Um, the average size of money that across the board, no matter what platform you're on, industry-wide, you're talking about five to $10,000 is the industry average of what entrepreneurs will raise using a rewards-based crowdfunding site. Now that's, for many folks, it's not a lot of money, but it is a great way to test your product in the marketplace. It, it really, uh, the beauty of crowdfunding is you're able to get feedback from these supporters to help you perhaps evolve your product, to tweak your product or service. And so for that reason alone, it's, it's kind of worthwhile to test your product in the marketplace using a rewards-based crowdfunding site. Having a dynamic video, a short dynamic video, also is key to having a successful crowdfunding campaign. I can't stress that enough. And it's very easy today with, with the smartphones that we all have to be able to uh, create a dynamic video to tell your story. So those are some of the key elements, but you, you definitely want to create some momentum in the beginning when you're raising capital using crowdfunding. So quite often what I would encourage you to do is talk to some of your key friends that are planning to support your project and have them support your project from the first moment the project goes live. Because you want to get some early momentum so folks out there, when they see your project on a crowdfunding site, they know that there's some momentum behind it. And everybody wants to be attached to a project that they think will be successful. So try to get a few of your friends to support your project uh, early on in the campaign. Um, but really, one of the keys is to work it like you were working your business. A lot of folks think that you can just sit back and collect the money on a crowdfunding campaign, and that's just not the case. You really have to work it like your business, constantly tweaking your story, reaching out to your database two, three times, perhaps in the first week or two, giving them updates on how close you are to reaching your funding goal. And speaking of funding goal, you certainly want to approach this in a realistic manner. You don't want to create such a far-fetched funding goal that it would be unrealistic to reach that funding goal. So um, I suggest, you know, try to be more conservative about it. What's nice about crowdfunding, rewards-based crowdfunding, is you can have more than one campaign. So you might want to start out very conservatively maybe trying to raise ten or twenty thousand dollars for a particular aspect of your business and maybe it's just you want to raise enough money to um, create a dynamic website or something like that and then come back two or three months later for another phase of crowdfunding so that would be a suggestion uh, I'll be happy to take some questions at the end as well um, there is no limit to how much money you can ask for on a rewards-based crowdfunding site. So that's the good news. The next type of crowdfunding is called equity-based crowdfunding. And the, the main significant difference is that the folks supporting your project doing equity-based crowdfunding, they're getting a piece of your business. You're offering them some equity of your company. And that's a huge difference. Um, so there are three basic rules from the JOBS Act. The JOBS Act was created five years ago. It was signed by the president and signed by Congress. And for the first time in 80 years, the JOBS Act permitted 
small companies to raise capital, really being able to generally solicit the general public for money. Before that time, you before five years ago, if you wanted to raise money and you were a private company, you basically had to call a broker dealer up and he or she called his or her friends who are broker dealers and qualified investors and that's how you raised money prior to the Jobs Act. If you were a small company, you weren't doing an IPO, for example. Um, after the Jobs Act, the laws indicated that you could generally solicit almost any form of advertising, any legal form of advertising. You could use television, the internet, uh, newspaper, what have you, to promote your project. Now, the key differentiators between three different types of equity crowdfunding have to do mostly with who you're going to take money from. There are basically accredited investors and unaccredited investors. There's approximately somewhere between seven and 10 million accredited investors in the United States today. Accredited investors by definition are folks that generally earn $200,000 a year for the last two of the last three years, have a net worth of a million dollars excluding their primary residence. Uh, if they're a married couple, they would need to earn $300,000 together in the last two of three years. So those are accredited investors. Uh, and then of course everybody else is considered unaccredited. So the first type of crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, I wanted to share with you today is called Regulation D 506C. Reg D 506C. And this is specifically to accredited investors. Uh, there is no limit to how much money you can raise doing the Reg D 506C. Um, you do need to verify that the investors are accredited. So you can't just take their word for it. There has to be, a, there's a verification process that is um, set up today. There, there are companies that solely are involved in verifying that the investors are accredited. Um, but you can generally solicit. Um, it's a fast closing process. You, you're not getting the SEC involved. Um, you can have up to 2,000 investors, um, and the stock can be transferred after one year. Um, so it's a very easy and inexpensive way to test the market and see what you can raise uh, using equity crowdfunding. Um, I certainly encourage you to make sure you have a good attorney and a good accountant on hand um, because you will need those kinds of services to determine um, the valuation of your company, to make sure you have uh, audited financials in place and things of that nature that your investors will want to see. All right, the second type of equity crowdfunding we're going to talk about today is really called Title III or crowdfunding uh, from the JOBS Act. Here, the limitations are $1 million in a 12-month period. So you have a cap of being able to raise $1 million in 12 months. You can take money from accredited and unaccredited investors. So basically, anybody can invest in the company. Um, and you're going to rely on the investor to self-certify. Um, in terms of if they are accredited or not. But like I said, you don't have to have accredited investors for Title III. Um, there really are not a whole lot of restrictions, although you, in terms of promotion, you do have to work with a qualified broker dealer or a crowdfunding platform. There are many crowdfunding platforms that cater to Title III equity crowdfunding. Um, if you want to email me at the end of the session, I'll be happy to mention some names to you. Um, some of the bigger companies would be uh, companies like WeFunder or Funders Club or Angel List or EquityNet, for example. Those are some very popular names. Um, also, uh, you do have to have audited financial statements if you're raising $500,000 or more. And uh, if you're raising $500,000 or 
actually, if you're raising between $100,000 and $500,000, you'd have to have a certified fin a, a CPA basically sign off on your financials. If you're raising less than $100,000, um, you know, you don't have to have any of that kind of a validation. Title III came out about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's been growing and growing and growing. We waited for it for several years. Uh, Reg D-506 actually came out first and was approved. And there are hundreds and even thousands of companies to date that have raised money on the Reg D-506C. And there are many companies today that have raised money successfully in Title III of the Jobs Act. The next type of equity crowdfunding is called Regulation A+. Here you can raise up to $50 million. So for most startups and early growth companies, $50 million will probably be sufficient capital. You can also raise the capital from unaccredited and accredited investors. So that's the beauty of Reg A+. Plus. Um, some of the chat, some of the cons or negatives, if you will, is that the price of entry is high. In other words, in order to launch a Reg A+ plus crowdfunding campaign, you're probably going to have to invest somewhere in the neighborhood of seventy-five thousand to one hundred and twenty-five thousand between lawyers and accountants um, in order to in order to launch the campaign. There is quite a bit of reporting involved. Basically, a Reg A+ plus crowdfunding campaign is what we call a mini IPO. You're, you're, you're practically jumping through the same hoops that you would with an IPO, but for a lot less money in terms of outlay. So um, that's something that maybe you would consider doing after you tried your hand at Reg D506 or Title III or, uh, or even a rewards-based crowdfunding campaign. So that's the ecosystem of crowdfunding today. Let's talk a little bit about how crowdfunding differs from the ecosystem called peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, sometimes called P2P or, or yeah, or peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, this ecosystem is approximately 10 years old. It's grown to $26 billion from 2015, so obviously it's even larger today. And, and, and the basic concept is that you're eliminating the middleman here, which is the bank. As uh, everyone knows, from 2008, banks and the financial crisis, banks really started to tighten up their lending practices, making it more difficult to borrow money from banks, especially if you're a startup. And so that's the onset of peer-to-peer -peer lending. So it's a new way for borrowers to have access to money they might not have gotten approval for by banks and other standard financial institutions. Um, it's a new way for borrowers to secure a loan electronically from individual investors like you through a web-based platform. So in other words, a web-based platform exists taking investor money from individuals return and loaning that money out to individuals or small businesses for either small business, for educational purposes, or for any type of personal loan. And peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms generally fall into five or six categories. I've mentioned some of them already, personal loans, educational loans, auto loans, real estate loans, business loans. Those are the primary areas of the peer-to-peer -peer platforms as they exist today. Um, so there are, um, if you're, there are platforms that allow you to borrow money for as little as $1,000 and as high as $5 million if you're looking for, let's say, a business line of credit or a business loan and everything in between. So the nice part about 
working with a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform is the ease of use. It's set up extremely easy, and uh, our next speaker uh, is actually one of those peer-to-peer -peer companies, and, and David will be speaking more about that, but they're really very user-friendly. The application process is very fast. In many cases, you know if you qualify within 24 to 48 hours, as opposed to going through a bank and in many cases having to wait two or three weeks to find out. So that's why peer-to-peer -peer lending has been so popular uh, and is a $26 billion industry and growing. Um, in many cases, if you want to be the investor, if you want to be on the investor side and earn a rate of return, um, many of the platforms allow you to invest for as little as $25. So it is a great way to diversify your own savings and investment portfolio by investing in some of these peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending notes. So for example, Prosper is uh, one of the first, one of the first peer-to-peer -peer lending companies in the industry. And so just to give you a, a, an example of what you could earn on a peer-to-peer -peer lending site, uh, currently, if you were an investor in the Prosper notes, um, they have yielded an average of 7.57% with a diversified mix of notes that you would be investing in uh, through Prosper. That's just one example, but you know, through the diversification of actually investing in many notes, it is a, a relatively safe way to diversify and to have a reasonable return. And David can speak to you more about that and what Street Shares is actually um, helping investors today. So uh, another, another great way to determine which peer-to-peer -peer lending site is, is useful for you is so just to go to their FAQs. Um, and that'll kind of help you decide which platform might be the right one for you. All of them have a very easy application process. Um, if you want to check out uh, our website, which is joinworthy.com, we have done a lot of heavy lifting for you guys. In other words, we took a look at the industry and vetted out and really took a look at the best of breed peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. Um, if you wanna to go to joinworthy.com, you could go through that page that's for borrowers and there's no cost for it and you it'll save you a lot of time. That's really why we're doing it. It's a service, it'll save you a lot of time to see uh, which peer-to-peer -peer lending sites might be the most appropriate for you. Um, I think that's that kind of wraps it up. Um, it, I'm really excited to be part of this. Um, I welcome any emails. Uh, you can reach me at andrew at joinworthy.com. That's andrew at joinworthy.com. I'll turn it over to you, Elvis, and I'm certainly welcome to take questions at the end. Hey, Andrew, we have uh, some questions right now, and um, I don't know if you want to take them right now or at the end. I'm, I'm good, we can try them now. Yeah, so I put in a chat box. Can you see them? Uh, no, no, I don't see any of your questions. Oh, do I? Oh, chat. Let's see. I, all right, click on that. All right. Um, you talk about crowdfunding a product. How does this apply to a service instead of a product? Uh, great question. Um, there's, there's really no difference. I mean. When, when we had peer backers as a crowdfunding platform, we helped about 5,000 companies raise capital, and I would say half of them were probably service-oriented companies. So um, are we talking about, I guess my question to the person who's asking it is, I don't know if you're referring to rewards-based crowdfunding or equity-based crowdfunding, um, but really the difference, there really is no difference. Uh, you wanna have a viable product or service, right? Because you're telling a story, you're asking people to support you, whether they're investors or not, they wanna believe in what you're doing. They wanna believe that you can execute. Have you put together a viable management team? You know, Can you execute on what you're saying you're going to do in terms of growing the business? 
Um, as far as the rewards, if it's a rewards-based crowdfunding uh, project, um, and, and you don't have a product to offer because you're a service company, then what you would want to do is create some product um, that is that has some perceived value. It could be as little as a t-shirt, or it could be something more innovative, uh, something unique. Uh, the average contribution from a supporter in a crowdfunding campaign usually reigns between $25 and $100. So that might give you an idea of what kind of, uh, what kind of rewards to be able to offer them. Um, if you have a service, so for example, if you're opening up a service and you think it's viable to offer it as a reward, then offer perhaps that service as a reward as well. All right, there's some other questions. Uh, I have a fitness and nutrition business and it's just me. I haven't tried to go viral because I have yet to find others who want to be part of what I'm building. So I have to make sure I can manage it solo. So have been conservative in everything and let word of mouth be my advertising. So is there a question here? I do have a but say I'm not sure I see the question. Elvis, do you see the question? Um, no, I, I I'm reading it just says that the type of business the person is starting a fitness and nutrition business. I haven't tried to go viral. I, I'm not sure I there's a question there. We also have a uh, Richard. He's asking like uh, what are you? I need five hundred and fifty million dollars? I think Richard's saying I need $150 million. Uh, well, 150, I'm curious what you need 150 million for. That is, um, I don't recall any crowdfunding project to date uh, raising that kind of money, whether it's equity crowdfunding or not. So I would say try to break it up into different phases. If you need 150 million total, is there a way for you to break it up into maybe 10 million the first phase and upon success? You see, one of the nice things about crowdfunding is if you're successful at crowdfunding, it attracts angel investors and VCs. VCs and angel investors specifically look for successful crowdfunding campaigns. So that's another incentive to try your hand at crowdfunding because you'll have an easier time finding the bigger players who are looking to invest more money. I don't know if that helps, but um, anyway, you certainly can email me if you have some additional questions. Elvis, is there any more that I see? Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'll let you know if you have any more. Uh, now okay. I want to like to pass it to David. David is uh, from Street Shares, and he'll introduce himself and give you a little more insights on what other marketplaces are out there for accessing the capital. David? Yes. Hi there, everyone. So great to be with you today. And thanks to Elvis and IVMF for setting this all up. And a great great initial portion there through Andrew. Uh, this, is, this will be a nice continuation of some of the content, more on the debt side than on, on the equity side. But grateful to be here. Uh, my camera wasn't working as well as I'd like today, but I do have several slides here. So we'll go through those and be glad to share those afterwards as well. Um, so a little background on me, I'm, I'm a member of Street Shares. I've been here since the early days of the company, uh, the number three employee, and now I manage all the sales and most of the client-facing uh, side of the business. Uh, I'm a USMC veteran, so Marine Corps Inf Infantry Officer. Uh, so thanks to all you out there that are veterans uh, watching uh, to you and your families. Uh, and there's my email address. If you can, I can be helpful, please call or email at any time. Okay, so... Three topics we'll go over, uh, really just two, and then questions. We'd love to you know, answer any questions you all have. Um, first, uh, you know, I'm going to go over just some basics of financing and, and complement some of the comments uh, that Andrew made. Uh, we've, got a, we've produced a, a book, The Ultimate Guide to Funding Your Veteran-Owned Small Business. So uh, you can go to our website anytime and download that. It's, it's an e-book. Uh, and then we'll go over some business funding options, and again, more focused on the on the debt side. Um, Street shares a little bit about us. As, as Andrew mentioned, we are a peer-to-peer -peer lender. 
and we you know we've been around uh, about four years. We match uh, investors with borrowers, and uh, those are all small business owners. We don't do personal loans, uh, but it's a peer-to-peer -peer model uh, funding um, businesses. And in our case, we focus on veteran-owned businesses. Although we'll lend to anybody, but that's where we spend spend most of our time. Okay, so just uh, as a resource here, things to think about um, when you are, uh, you know, looking for financing. And this is more a little bit more in the mature stage than than kind of the idea phase. But uh, you always want to think about your financial needs. So if I need forty thousand uh, dollars, when do I need that, and what what are my cash flows over the next six to eight months uh, that I'm going to need funding? Uh, and is it for growth? Uh, you know, what what are the reasons? Do I want it to grow, or do I want it to uh, acquire another business or, or build a patio for my restaurant? Uh, you know, those are important questions when talking to a lender, uh, the, the why behind the use of funds. Um, people will often take money, but it's important to know how you, exactly you're going to apply that, whether it's a bank or online lender. Uh, what is the urgency? As, as Andrew pointed out, uh, you know, banks can take a long time to fund, whereas a peer-to-peer -peer lender, or at least some of the newer online lenders, can fund in a matter of uh, 24, 48 hours, and some some folks same day funding. Um, so you know, it's always better to think about money when you don't need it and get it in place than when when it's too late. Uh, and then types of funding, we'll, we'll go over some of those: debt versus equity, and then where you are kind of in the life cycle. Uh, you know, are you raising a couple hundred thousand from friends and family, or are you raising uh, several million dollars from from investors? So next slide here is the, the basic types of financing. What are the, what are the avenues and options? Um, so as Andrew covered very, very nicely, uh, you, know, there's, you can self-finance, you can raise equity through crowdfunding or through other means, through investors, uh, or you can apply for, for debt funding, which is uh, you know, a loan. Uh, self-financing is, uh, you know, as, as our co-founders at Streetshirt would tell you, is, is a lot of the, you know, when you kind of early stage and you get started, you just need to bootstrap and uh, you know, get fun, uh, funds from family and friends, but it can be you know, very individual effort, uh, just trying to get off the ground, and then once you have some traction, you, know, you can raise equity or other, other means. Uh, but it all depends on the stage of your business and what options you have, have available to you. So if we, if we think about the, the life cycle or the continuum of, of uh, business and, and, and fundraising and, and uh, looking at raising capital, you know, the infant idea, the stage, there's, uh, you know, some, some options there that you want to consider. First, we would always say, uh, I would always say, uh, look for grants. Uh, if, you know, grants are free money, so um, these are a great opportunity to uh, get, a, you know, a check for a couple thousand dollars and then help launch your business or grow your business that way. Um, you know, if you are getting a grant, you want to ask what's behind that, if it's a federal grant, through um, you know a government agency, what are those uh, long-term implications? Are you giving away your IP or any intellectual property? Uh, but a lot of, there's a lot of great opportunities out there for these days, especially for veterans, to get to get grants. Uh, Co-investment for friends and family. Um, the the three they often call it the three F's: friends, family, and fools. Uh, fools being lighthearted, but folks that are willing to invest in you when you have your idea or early stage business. Uh, and you know, people that don't know you might not be as willing. So friends and family are the logical place to go. And uh, Richard covered the you know the great uh, Andrew. Sorry, Andrew covered the great options on um, crowdfunding, equity versus uh, versus rewards based and um, donation based, and then philanthropic loans and angel investors. So on, on the grants topic, uh, Street Shares, we actually have a separate foundation. Just to, you know, we we do every month. We do a commander's uh, or a veteran business grant on our page there. If you go to the foundation, it's a separate entity than our than our for profit organization. Um, but here's a, another screenshot from the website. So just an example of what's out there. We do. Every, uh, we'll be launching this again shortly, either in December, January, December or January. Uh, but every month we do a first place, second place, third place grant. I know um, there's other folks out there like Lending Tree and uh, some other groups that do, you know, and JP Morgan Chase has a uh, Main Street business grant that all give out grants to, to business owners. So uh, always look for the, those type of options out there. And for us, that because that you have to submit a video and kind of tell your story, it's it's almost a little bit it feels like a little bit like crowdfunding because you're you're kind of you're giving your story through a video and 
and talking about your business, and then uh, there, there's a voting, voting that takes place. So again, the, the early stage, you know, if you are, you know, a year in business or so, you have a little bit of revenue, maybe you got a few contracts, you've got some customers. Um, these are a lot of words, but I'll summarize quickly. You know, you, you also have to think carefully about what you're getting into. Um, I like to give the example, if you take out your cell phone right now or you on your computer and you Google small business funding, small business loans, you almost be overwhelmed with the uh, massive amount of information out there uh, that might not always be the most transparent or honest, and uh, and Google has the top three are often ads, people trying to get you to click on their link. So uh, you want to be very cautious and, and uh, think about what you're getting into as, you, as you're an early stage borrower and you might not have a be ready to get a bank loan yet. So merchant cash advance, uh, you know, these are these are quick, they can fund in a day, uh, but and they'll often how it works is they will give you a loan, say $50,000, but then every single day when you do your credit card transaction or you ha are waiting on invoices, they may charge you, you know, a couple percentage points, three, four percent on that each transaction, which can add up to 50 to 100 percent APR. Um, as, and as you know, you know, bank loans are around six to, you know, four to eight percent generally, um, and credit cards can be, you know, 10 to, to 25 percent. But when you're in that range, it's very expensive money you want to be careful in how you think about that. Also, prepayment, oh, look at the term, long terms. It's nice to have that money in hand, but you should think about long term if they're going to be prepayment penalties. So um, just like your mortgage, if you were to pay that off quickly, there's no penalties. They would just you know, pay it in full there. Some folks online will have you pay all the future interest. So you take out a five-year loan, you pay it down in two years, they still want to charge you the interest of the remaining three years. So. Read the terms carefully. Always good to um, read with the keen eye, or even have an attorney look at look at some of those things. Uh, again, know your true cost, and then know you know what happens if there's trouble. Is the lender going to work with you, or are they going to send a collections company after after you uh, to your door every day? You want to understand uh, what kind of company you're dealing with. As a resource, there's a as a uh, small business small business borrower's bill of rights out there that a lot of folks, including us, have signed on to. Some of the you know the good players in the industry. Uh, and there's a link there on the website that can that can show you who those folks are. But it would be good to ask your lender uh, if they if they sign on to that. More early stage, uh, you know, for veterans, uh, you can again loans are an option. Really, you want to have you know ideally hundred thousand dollars in revenue is is a good number to think about when you want debt funding. Most online lenders are going to lend anywhere from ten to twenty percent of your annual revenue. So $100,000 might be a $10,000, $20,000 loan. A million dollar loan, a million dollar business would be, you know, $100,000 loan, uh, as because these folks can't afford to take on too much risk when lending out, lending out money. They've got to make sure that comes back to them. Uh, and then early stage, as um, Andrew covered well, angel investors, venture capitalists, uh, always looking for the next big thing and and willing to invest money, but you will give up a share of equity and part of your company in that if you're taking out equity. Uh, versus debt, you just have to pay the money back. Um, but equity is nice because you you just have the capital, no payments until you either go public or someone acquires you. Now moving on, as, as you think about the timeline into a more kind of growth stage, and uh, this would be a couple years, you know, 25k in revenue. Really, you know, you want to see maybe 100k. And here's where you can start thinking about a more mature lending product, like a line of credit. Uh, we have those. Many online lenders have that product, but you can, um, you know, get a hundred thousand dollar line of credit, perhaps, and then you know take that out. Uh, say you need to make payroll on Thursday, you draw down fifty k. A week later, you pay that back down, kind of like a credit card. But very nice to have that flexibility as a business owner, so you're not in a cash crunch and calling up uh, someone for a loan when it's too late, but you put it in place ahead of time. Uh, same thing. Venture capitalists are always there. And then now, you know, as you get into the mature stage, it's time to think about an SBA loan or a traditional bank loan. Uh, it's a good time now where you start talking to a banker, get a relationship with them, and they might be able to help you out. A few notes here on banks, uh, and, and you know, we're we work with banks all the time. Uh, we want to get folks eventually to you know a larger bank facility. Uh, again, that's going to be the the cheapest form of capital is going to be a, be a bank loan. And an SBA loan, uh, which is co-guaranteed by the Small Business Administration, 
the SBA does not make the loan, the banks make the loan, but the SBA is co-guaranteeing a portion which allows um, the cost to be lower for, for small business owners. Uh, but credit unions, banks are all uh, great folks to talk to, uh, but they're, they're gonna wanna see often two, three, four years in business, consistent cash flows, and it can, just, it can take months at a time for them to finish the process for underwriting. So this slide here, you know, summarizing uh, all, all that I've kind of talked about and, and just uh, try to get into one, you know, graphical narrative here of, so I've got the concept idea. This is uh, especially where, um, you know, Andrew was talking about, you have the early stage uh, crowdfunding, Kiva Zip, another partner of IVMF, um, grants SBA. If I'm, I'm looking at the left column here as you look at it, um, you know, the debt and equity options. Uh, and the, by the people there, that's the friends and family, kind of those little icons of individuals. A lot of our you know, folks that we know that are, that are business owners will put those on business credit cards and, and fund that way for a while until they can get a larger, larger size loan. You get into, you know, Axion is another uh, great, you know, nonprofit small business micro lender. Uh, and they're actually an investor. They, their venture arm invested in street shares as we were launching the company years ago, so we're, we're partnered with them as well. Uh, and then you get into early growth stage in the third third column there, that's where someone like an alternative lender like Streetures can help, and then as you get into growth stage, you know, you wanna think about banks, and uh, in, the, in the equity world, that's when, I think it was Henry's question, uh, you know, you can start thinking about raising larger sums of money. Uh, for a tech company or a growth company that's venture capital backed, you're generally raising uh, you know, 1 million and then maybe like a round of 8 million and then 25 million and then like companies such as Uber, Airbnb, um, the big companies are now raising rounds of $250 million um, after, you know, a decade or so or several years of continuous investments through, through venture capitalists. Okay, only a couple more slides here, so looking forward to any, any questions. Um, you know, the documents you want to think about, uh, just in general as a business owner or with the business plan, you know, you want to have, always have your plan ready summary, your elevator speech, uh, what, what is it you're trying to accomplish, what is it you do, what's the service you provide, or the product you provide. Legal documents, you know, just, you know, we use taxes to prove business ownership, but if you have anything else, always, to, you know, always want to keep that handy. Tax returns. Um, when you when underwriting a small business for these smaller size loans, we're often looking at the individual as much as we are looking at the business. So, you know, making sure your credit score is in place, and we look at the personal income of the owner uh, as well as the business revenue uh, when looking at smaller size, you know, twenty thousand type dollar loans. Financial statements always great to have those. Uh, you know, whether it's quarterly, monthly. Um, using QuickBooks or some kind of system where you have an you know up to date balance sheet, profit and loss statement, and cash flow statement to to make sure that you're uh, it's a good way to have a healthy snapshot of the, of the business and know what your assets and liabilities are. And then yeah, credit reports you don't have to have this handy, but it's a good idea to know what your personal credit score is and the and the business credit as well. Uh, and then any collateral you might have. Banks, uh, yeah, note on banks are always going to want collateral, so they're going to want to lend against. For example, property or real estate or the assets of the business. Whereas some of the online lenders, uh, it's a largely an unsecured product, so they're not securing it with assets, um, which is what, one of the reasons that the price can be higher than a traditional bank loan. So uh, I mentioned up front the you know we there is a, a small we have you know several several books that are great to download. Uh, these are all free on our website. There, there's a link there. And you can go get a you know veteran owned business small guy. We just published one recently on the basics of contract financing. If you're looking to be a government contractor as, as a business owner, uh, and feel free to please use it as much as that as can be helpful to you. And with that, you know that that's a quick quick snapshot, um, an overview of of you know funding a a small business. And so I would say, you know, you want to think about. Uh, what is always? I guess the main point I would say is think about funding ahead of time, so you get it, get it in place when the timing is right. And then uh, number one, and then number two, just do you know do your research on 
what's out there and talk to some folks like IVMF to see if they recommend anybody in, in, in the space of lending um, and you know make sure you know what you're getting into, whether it's equity or debt. Uh, but really grateful to be here and, and you know thanks for the opportunity to present some content and I guess I can I can take any questions that we might have. Thank you, Andrew and uh, David. Uh, that's very nice of you guys to share some information. I'm gonna ask everybody out there if you guys have any questions, please uh, and put them in a YouTube chat box and we'll make sure we answered. But I do have questions for you guys, uh, both of you. Can you guys give us some um, recommendation or ex you know, like guidance for individuals who are in uh, planning stages of their business? They just you know, work on their business plan and they're looking for funds and also, can you, for individuals who are growing their businesses and looking to expand and need funds, like, do you have any recommendations for them as where to start, you know, how to go about, you know, asking for information and getting the, like, the process that, that they should go through? Unmute yourself, Andrew, please. Let me see. Uh, I think, yeah, he might still be, can you hear me? This is David. Okay, yeah, I, I can I can jump in here. I think, um, you know, to my, so as you're thinking about it, a great resource that we've often seen um, is, you know, the, the SBA has a lot of good resources out there. So um, small business, SBDCs, small business development centers are a great place to go get some um, free objective advice. Uh, and there's, I think, 1,300 around the country uh, that are willing to help small business owners and, they're, and they're, they exist to, to give advice on topics that, such as these. And I know, having spoken, spoken to many of them, they, they often get these, these questions about financing. Um, they also have SCORE, which is a great resource, and those are kind of senior mentors, maybe a retired business owner that uh, can advise, and they have local chapters around the country as well. Um, I think that's a pretty helpful place to, to start. Thank you, David. Andrew, you're on mute, but if, do you have anything to add? Andrew, you are mute. You're muted. Your mic is muted. Uh, is that better? Ah, I didn't put. I didn't think I put myself on mute, but okay. <laughs> uh, was it always on mute? <laughs> so, uh, I again, if you're uh, what David mentioned, SCORE is a great organization, and I would encourage everyone to uh, check out their local SCORE office for sure. Um, if you're if you're specifically looking for capital and you have a plan, I think there's no better way to validate that plan than to try a rewards-based crowdfunding. Uh, it costs very little, if anything, to do. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain because you're going to gain validation by seeing who is willing to support you even if it's for $25 or $50. Uh, and you're gonna get feedback from these folks. Uh, so it, there's just so many advantages to doing a rewards-based crowdfunding. If you are looking for maybe five, 10, 15, $20,000, if you're looking for something a lot more than that, uh, then you probably want to really think long and hard whether you want to invest the time in a crowdfunding campaign um, because the average, as I mentioned during uh, my presentation, the average amount of money raised on a rewards-based site is five to $10,000. And that's in a period of 30, 60, 90 days. I didn't mention that before, but crowdfunding campaigns generally go for as long as 90 days, no more, at least reward-based crowdfunding campaign. And, and there's a good reason for that. You want to create urgency. You want to get people to think about supporting you now, not three months from now. So again, there are many advantages to trying your, trying your hand at crowdfunding. Um, there are many sites out there. Kickstarter and Indiegogo are probably the two largest. Uh, GoFundMe is also one of the largest. Um, I would just check out those sites. 
Um, if you and there's a lot of information on the internet on how to go about launching a crowdfunding campaign. Feel free to email me. I'll be happy to send you some best practices or go to the website. That's Thank you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. Um, if you guys have any questions, we'll give you a few seconds to type in in the chat box on YouTube. But like Andrew and David had mentioned, there's a lot of things out there. IBMF is always here for you guys. Just send us a link. We'll be happy to share any grants that are out there for veterans and military families. We're happy to help you get a loan through our partners like Street Shares, Action, Kiva Zip, and get you connected. So, but if you're out there on your own and working on your own, like, please take advice from these guys as well. So let's see if anybody has any questions we'll answer. If not, I just want to thank you, Andrew and David. Thank you so much for doing this, and I appreciate your time. My pleasure. It was a real pleasure. Same here. Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a great day. Okay, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, this will be recorded. I will send the recorded link out to you later today. And our next Veteran, Veteran Network webinar is on October 19th, and we're going to talk about government contracting. Look out for our email to, for, to register. If you register, you can get a recorded link. If not, just send it to me. Send me an email at ebbtap.svr.edu, and I'll make sure I get you the link. Thank you all, and have a good day. Bye-bye.